like to call the uh, June 5th school or June 4th uh, school committee meeting to order uh, before we uh, start the meeting I'd like to, to have a moment of silence for uh, Frank Driscoll who uh, the town veterans agent for many many years and uh, I got to know uh, Frank through uh, coaching my daughter in softball. He ran that for many years, the Reading Girls Softball Leagues, and I think he might have coached at the high school level. He was a so, JV Girls Softball coach. Yeah, and, and yeah, Frank sadly passed away suddenly this weekend, so we could have a moment of silence for Frank. Thank you. So uh, tonight's meeting will, after uh, public input reports, will we'll have uh, uh, Joshua Eaton update and the kindergarten update. And at that point, uh, some housekeeping items, and then we'll we'll go into executive session. So uh, first, I'd like to ask for any public input for anything that's not on the agenda tonight. Thank you. Rebecca Lieberman, 50 Pratt Street. I just wanted uh, to read the school committee powers and duties to just please remind you that um, things like cancellation of the math update would seem to be at odds with some of these. The school committee has all the powers. Can, uh, um, I'll start with the committee takes a broad view of its functions. It sees them as legislative or policy making, appraisal, provision of financial resources, public relations, and educational planning and evaluation. I would argue that canceling the math update and not rescheduling it um, doesn't uh, allow for appraisal, doesn't allow for public relations, for the public to ask questions and learn more about the big changes that have taken place in middle school and high school math. Um, for next year, there is the elimination of what used to be a full year course. It's been replaced by uh, being added to another formerly full year course. It, the form of the pre-calculus course is gone. It's now been replaced by having something called analytic trigonometry added to the former full year algebra two course. I had a lot of questions about that. I'm sure other parents do too. Um, the impact of collapsing of levels in middle school math. How is that working out? How can we appraise that? Um, so I would just really hope and urge you to please reschedule the math meeting to allow for some questions. Um, to be answered, for the public to be heard. Thank you. Thank you. I can give you a copy of this if you like. Do you need one? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, actually, it's through the consent that you so we have a consent agenda to approve with some donations. Um, there was move to approve the consent agenda. Uh, one of the items is was separate from the packet, but we all have it at our places. Any? Is there any anyone who would like to remove? All 
All those in favor of the consent agenda? 6 0. Thank you. Uh, this reports now, so I just like to uh, briefly say, just thank uh, everybody that was involved. And I know Mr. Bacher spent a lot of time doing that yesterday with the graduation. I thought it was a great day. Uh, and uh, we just uh, wish the class of 2018 well. And, and uh, you know, that's, as we always say, one of, at least one of my favorite days of the year. You know, it's positive and, and uh, you know, lots of happy students that are moving on to a lot of great things. So, great day. Just to cer certainly add, there was a whole bunch of staff members that contributed to making that happen. Um, thank, uh, thankfully, the weather was nice and cool. And um, always, as always, Reading Co-op donates water. And um, just like to also thank Dr. Darty. His words were really inspiring. I think uh, I always wonder how much of, how much the graduates are really paying attention. And I think, you know, if they could listen to that 20 years later, they'd probably think a little bit different about it. But um, I think that they it was a great um, sentiment to send students off with, and really appreciate everything that went into that. And also, I it is it's the there's like two great two or three super great times of the year for school committee graduation is one of those teacher recognition is coming up um, so really appreciate that and uh, there was a lot of staff there so thank you okay are we sherry do you have any i don't have anything thank you okay i don't think so okay Linda? um there was or a doctor does <laughs> <laughs> There was a CPAC meeting, Special Education Parent Advisory Committee meeting on um, the 23rd where they got an update from Mrs. Wilson. So I'm going to let her, because I was at the security meeting, it was hard to be in two places at once. Um, so I'm going to let her update on that. There's a potential meeting, I'm not sure if it's been um, confirmed yet, on June 11th. That will be um, potentially in the RMHS Media Center. Um, I wanted to encourage folks to fill out your IEP surveys um, because your information that, and your feedback is really important and valued, as we heard in our last presentation by Mrs. Wilson. Um, and also to encourage people to check out the CPAC page on, because there are a lot of resources um, that's on reading.k12.ma.us. And I actually want to throw out a question. I'm not sure if this year they're doing a table at Friends yes. and Family yep. Day. That was they, are. Yes, they are. So um, to look for them. And then um, my other invitation is the Reading Embraces Diversity will also have a table at Friends and Family Day. There'll be things for kids to do um, and conversations to be had. So please look for both CPAC and for Red there. Um, and also just a quick mention that I'm looking forward to going to the movie presentation at BU on Intelligent Lives um, on Thursday night. So hopefully a bunch of us will come back with a report on that. Thank you. Jane. I have a quick one. Um, so I think the committee is aware and the community is aware that our town is turning 375 years old next year and a group has formed in the community to begin fundraising to raise money to have some big celebrations next year around this. The next one is Friday night. It's going to be so much fun. It's a trivia night fundraiser. They did a similar thing in the fall. I attended that one with Mrs. Webb and some of our family members and we had it was a, it was a really fun night. It's a great Friday night so I really do encourage um, folks to go. I will be going again. It is a great time. Um, so that's Friday June 8th at 7 p.m. at RCTV Studios. You can buy tickets online. It's $20 a person. Um, again, it's for Reading's 375th anniversary. And you can get your tickets at Reading375.com or if you're on Facebook, you can just search Reading 375 Trivia Night and you can buy your tickets uh, through Facebook. It's going to be a really fun time. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just briefly to talk about the CPAC meeting that we did have. Um, we talked about 
We've had a report card working group really looking at how to represent special education needs on the report card, not revamping the report card, but looking at it from that perspective. So I reported out on that. We talked about the program review of the Ridge program at um, Parker and just kind of our game plan of how we're going to present that information. We talked a little bit about staffing and then the CPAC is going to start planning at their next meeting for their elections. So the next meeting is scheduled for Monday, June 11th. I don't have the location. Um, and we did receive the program review from Melissa Orkin of the Bridge Program. I'm meeting with um, Ms. Shankland and um, Allison Wright, our team chair at Parker on Thursday to review it with them. And then from there, as I've discussed with the CPAC, our plan is to roll it out to the staff at Parker, the families at Parker, and then the CPAC. Once we've shared it with the staff and the parents, we'll make it public for anyone, but then we'll use the CPAC. And um, Dr. Dury and I talked about um, presenting it here as well. It's just the timing, it's just when we got it. Um, so it's hard this time of year mm -hmm. um, to kind of plan that out, but we want to make sure that we allow the families at Parker Middle School to see it prior to it becoming public, so. Thank you. I have a couple of things. Um, I want to update the community on the um, Barrows principal search. So um, the screening committee, and I would like to uh, recognize the following members of the, who participate in the Barrows screening committee. Uh, our two principals, um, Ricky Shanklin and Joanne King. Uh, teachers uh, Karina Becker, Julie Gilchrist, and Carol Casavant, Donna Walsh, the secretary, and Kristen Agami, parent. Um, so they they met and interviewed several candidates last week. Um, they moved forward a group of um, pre-finalists. Uh, con I conducted second interviews, and so I will announce tomorrow who um, those finalists will be. Um, there will be an open microphone night for the community on Wednesday evening starting at 6 o'clock in the Barrows Cafeteria, and all are welcome to attend. Um, the following Tuesday, we will have site visits to Barrows and uh, staff open microphone in the afternoon after school, and then depending on if I have enough information, we'll either make a decision then or go uh, to site visits um, to those schools. My hope is to have an announcement by the last day of school. The, uh, the only other thing I want to mention, I do, I do want to congratulate also the class of 2018. I had the opportunity to attend baccalaureate and, of course, graduation. Um, and just the amount of uh, time and effort and participation that goes into that, those types of events. And um, there was a whole senior week last week, which included the all-night party, which included the boat cruise um, in class day. These are all traditional events that our senior classes and the barbecue. These are all traditional events our class have every year. Um, and there's a lot of staff involvement in the planning of that. Certainly our administration, high school administration is involved with that and our two senior class advisors. So I just wanna, I wanna thank all of the people that were involved. It was a very safe and enjoyable week for our, for our seniors and it did you know, culminate yesterday with a really great ceremony um, for, for our students. Did you want to mention that I didn't report? I thought you might the security summit. Uh, oh, that's right. We had the security summit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that seems so long ago now. Um, so Wednesday, two weeks ago, two weeks ago Wednesday, we had the security summit. I would say um, probably about 25 people from the community attend, in addition to town and school staff. Um, did a presentation which is now online on our website um, as to both the school security piece um, but also some of the things that the town uh, police and fire facilities are doing to help support the safety and security of our schools and town buildings. Um, I think the main message that we wanted to communicate and I hope we were able to is the the very collaborative effort that we have with town, school, police, fire um, facilities, that we're all working together to make sure that our schools and our town buildings are as safe and secure as they can be. So, I thought it was a good presentation, and I thought the community questions were excellent. Yes. Too. 
It is also, I believe that's on RCTV, that presentation. It was May 23rd. Was it May 23rd? Same night. That's what it does seem like it was a long time ago. <laughs> that's all I have. Yes. Um, so, Dr. Jardy, there was one thing you mentioned at graduation yesterday that I have to admit um, that I was not aware of, but it's the project that's out in front of the high school right now. Uh, the um, Unity Project. The Unity Project. And I think it was a student, one of the students talked about the Unity Project. Who talked about I that? I did. You did. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I just th thought it might be, um, that was really, really impressive, and it might be worth just um, briefly sharing what that was and who participated. Sure. So the Unity Project is a community art project. It's actually, it's happened in several places all over the country. Um, I believe that the high school received funding from the PTO uh, to make it happen. Um, really it is to show unity in both school, town, um, region, country. Uh, it consists of 32 posts. Mm -hmm. um, it's on the front lawn of the high school right now. It consists yeah. of 32 posts, and each post is an identifier. So there could be an identifier that uh, I like the arts, or I like cats, or uh, I'm, an ado I'm an adopted child, or um, you know I'm LGBTQ, or some, some identifier. And then classes came out there, and with Pink Yarn, they connected, each student connected to the identifiers that they were. So eventually what starts happening is you see this web and it's pink yarn. So you see this pink web starting to connect among all 32 of the, of the posts to show that we are all interconnected even though we all have differences. Mm -hmm. So it was a very powerful project, powerful display. Unfortunately, because of the rain, it's starting it's sag. to sag because yeah. yeah. uh, the yarn is Got heavy. getting heavy. Um, but it, um, there was an opening ceremony a few weeks ago. Um, at night, which was the, the community was invited, that um, the student council spoke and read a poem from Maya Angelou, um, uh, which I actually did read at um, at the baccalaureate as part of my remarks. Um, so, yeah, it was very, very. Uh, it was a great project that connected the school together. Oh, I'm, I'm just glad that it was still remained at graduation, given you talked about it and. Yeah, and as I, I as I drove around, then I'm like, I don't usually drive by that part of the school. I look back, I'm like, there it is, that amazing pink Unity web. I thought it was great. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're ready for the Joshua Eaton update. So just to set some context, um, as you know, this is Lisa Maria Bolito. Hey, everyone. Good evening. Joshua Eaton. Um, this is, this is Lisa's third uh, update of Josh Reed. Fourth, Fourth, Fourth update of Josh Reed. Oh, wait, was the one that one time when we did was like a no show, a do over? No. We were probably here for that, too. I just love coming here. Oh, good. And the other principals here. And the, uh, the only thing is if we could just hold the questions till, till the end. Sure. Okay. So uh, thank you once again for having me here with Dr. Eaton. One of my favorite things to do. I just want to recognize the audience and the staff and work to work with you. So I have Jamie Quinn, who's a second grade teacher, also my teacher principal. Um, Christine Lusk, who's my co-chair for the school council. Uh, Brittany Kurtz, who's a special ed teacher. Phyllis Green, who's also a special ed teacher. And Ann Mana, who's a kindergarten teacher. So thank you. Great. Okay. So, this little design is a bulletin board that's in our hallway that we created um, each classroom and staff member. Um, everybody fits in at Joshua Eaton, that's our goal. Um, this report reflects um, the school improvement plan goals. And so again, like I said, Christine Lusk is the co-chair with me on that committee. Parents are Julie Ross and Erin Gaffin. Staff is Sandy Emery, Susan Libby, Jamie Quinn, and community member Laura O'Neill and open meeting member um, Marianne Downing. She attends a lot of our meetings and gives great feedback. Um, and basically the goals during our meetings this year, we're reviewing the MCAS data. Uh, communication, our communication policy we just updated. Uh, we're, we're currently revising our JE handbook to make it more user friendly for our families. And evaluation of our attendance data you'll hear about tonight. 
Um, and so this slide is actually from the very first time that I was here, so I'm kind of like closing this, the loop, so to speak, this evening. Um, so our first goal was around literacy, um, and I'm very proud of our teaching staff. They really worked together collaboratively to help meet this goal um, in the best interest of our students. And also our students, um, you could see as we walk classroom to classroom through their journal writing, their independent reading, their partner reading, that they really took to this goal as well um, in raising their own literacy and, and kind of owning it like we wanted them to uh, own their learning. Um, and so some data points to circle back on. Um, the first data point is our early uh, reading inventory for kindergarten. Um, and you can see the, the different scores um, I've reported on the fall, the winter, and now the spring. And we're happy to sh show that um, in most areas, the score um, for our students was 98 to 100% success of all students with uh, hearing sounds, um, recording and hearing sounds and words. Um, and I'll just talk about that briefly again, um, as I did last time, is a challenging task. That's the task where it's basically sentence dictation. The teacher says a sentence, students need to write the sentence, and they're graded on capitalization, punctuation, and how closely the sentence matches the sound symbol relationship. So it's a difficult task for kindergartners. And uh, back in the winter, we were at 29%, and now we're at uh, 86%. So we're very proud of that score. It's amazing. Um, the same assessment is then given to our first graders, and we're very proud to say 100% of our first graders pass all of these subtests, um, which is remarkable because if we think about these students when they started the school year, um, they were some of our most neediest students at Joshua Eaton. So um, the teachers have worked really hard um, with our Title I staff as well as our reading staff, um, targeting interventions um, to students of need. Um, and so we're proud of um, the hard work and the effort that it shows here. Uh, this next slide is talking about our Faunus and Pinnell um, benchmark scores. And so um, to make it really simple, because I know before I've come with all these charts, so I just try to make it really simplistic to talk about. So these are our fall scores and our spring scores. And so just to review again, um, the level of academic um, Rigor changes each, I call it quarter, throughout the year. Um, and so the skills of the reading behaviors change. Um, and so what might be successful in the fall, for example, if we say a level B in uh, kindergarten, it's now a level D at the end of kindergarten. So the different, we're looking for different behaviors. So it looks like up and down, but it's really not an up and down, but um, these scores reflect students who are on or above grade level. So on this chart here, kindergarten in the fall, we had 58% of the students on or above grade level, and we currently have 81% of our kindergartners on or above grade level. First grade is 67% in the fall, now 74% uh, in the spring. Grade two is 63% in the fall, and now 69% in the spring. Third grade was 61% in the fall and now 53%. And I'll obviously go back to that one because I'm sure that's one is circled and highlighted all over the place, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Grade four is 47% in the fall and 65% in the spring. And fifth grade is 63% in the fall and now 70% um, in the spring. So at our previous presentation, we talked about reading to learn and learning to read and how they're two very different things and that usually comes together about third grade. So we have an extensive conversation talking about, we see a shift for kids that happens at different times, but typically at some point during third grade, some kids are still learning how to read and other kids are reading to gather information. And so what this dip does not surprise me, what it represents, um, for most kids, not all kids, because I can never say all kids, but what it does represent is that the reading behaviors that we're looking for at the end of third grade are things such as identifying mood as you're reading in a story, looking at more um, critical thinking skills around your comprehension, more inferencing, compared to the start of third grade where it's still more some inferencing but more on literal comprehension. And so we expect to kind of see that dip, and like I talked about last time, and we see a dip, and then we see a rise. And that's kind of exactly what this shows here. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's 
congratulations on that one. Um, and so then here's the Lexia Core 5 um, information. This was from my last presentation, and this is current data. And this data here shows these two bars are the same exact bar. It's showing where we started. Um, excuse me, just one minute. And so it shows that currently, this is where we are at as of May 2018, that 12% of our students, according to Lexia, are below grade level, 35% of our students are now on grade level, and 53% of our students are above grade level. So I just want to caution with this data that 12% at the end also includes students who are not using the program. So we have, do have some students who may have moved, who may, this is just not the best tool for them, but their names are still registered in here. Um, so I just want to caution that. But you can just tell by the colored bars that we've had a significant increase even from the winter to the spring. Our next goal was around family communication. Um, and so I talked about it a lot this school year, so I just thought I would add just one piece of information. This is from our tracks. So I provide um, our awesome PTO who creates uh, the tracks, um, but what's called Books and Bites. And so I provide a digital opportunity for student learning and then also a tangible paper book um, opportunity for learning. And the um, book, the literature, the children's literature tied to the Books and um, Bites is tied to the open circle social emotional curriculum. Um, and aligned to the timeline that our teachers are teaching those certain skills. So, um, and I don't take any credit for those graphics. That, that's our awesome PTO who, like I give them the names and they come up with the great graphics to match um, the communication. Our third goal um, was around attendance. And so um, we've done a lot of work looking at data, we've had a lot of initiatives that I have talked about last time. And so this chart shows that Eaton last year, um, percentage of attendance was 96%. Currently, right now, this is actually May, two weeks ago, is 96.2%. So two tenths of a percentile point up, we'll take it. Um, but the real difference and the real, where we're honing in our goal is about the importance of coming to school when you can. And so the number, percent of students who had 10 or more days of absences last year was 24.7%. And this year, it's 7.8. Wow. So we had a significant, wow. significant um, decrease in the number of students who are absent 10 or more days. And so at this point, it's really important to me that I um, thank the parents of Joshua Eaton for being very mindful and reflective of the attendance of their students coming to Joshua Eaton. I continue to have wonderful conversations about reasons why kids don't come to school um, on certain day and working with different families to support um, our uh, dismissals and tardies may increase, but that's okay because before kids were not coming to school at all during the day. Mm -hmm. And now parents are you know, making arrangements in that effort, which is challenging to get their students to come to school. So we greatly, greatly appreciate that. Okay, so what's happening at Joshua Eaton? So I was talking about the whole child, so I thought at this kind of loop around presentation, I would talk about all the awesome well, some of the awesome things. I'd be here all night and talk about all the awesome things uh, going on at Joshua Eaton. So I thought I'd start off with special education at JE. So um, our staff has participated, seven staff members and myself participated in a landmark online course. And this course was about uh, language-based learning disabilities. Not only did we talk about what does that actually mean, but learning strategies to support students, as well as um, there was a strand about executive functioning. And we all felt the course was just wonderful. Um, we had 11 members of the staff participated with me in a school-based co-teaching book group, where we talked about the six different kinds of co-teaching models and which models might fit um, at Joshua Eaton. So we uh, will have some piloting of that for next year. This summer, I have 12 staff members who will be uh, working on a responsive discipline book group where we're going to take the excellent work that was previously done at Joshua Eaton around the PBIS model and we're just going to fine tune it a little bit more um, using a responsive classroom book called Responsive Discipline and we're, we're excited about that work. Um, I've had special education staff that have uh, received LIPS training 
Um, we currently, actually this Thursday, Landmark is coming back again for a full day consultation with our special ed and general ed staff who work with students who participate in the bridge program. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, the gentleman from Landmark and I had a wonderful conversation where he was able to give me some great highlights that he saw um, around our bridge program. So that was exciting for us as well. Um, um, Dr. Do uh, Snow, uh, Dr. Doxy reminded me, I should have put up here, that my SPED staff and I have attended the last two CPAC presentations. So there was some professional development. One was on executive functioning and the other was on dyslexia. So thank you. We appreciated that. Um, my st uh, special education staff also participated um, in a Project Read concept training. And the reason I wrote it like that is because I did the training, but I'm not an official trainer. So I didn't want to make it look like they were, everyone's been Project Read trained. They were Project Read trained through me. So, um, but the, um, that was just another, um, I lost my words, intervention for us to use with, with our students. Um, our general ed staff, as well as our special ed staff, work together in collaborative planning, um, looking at individual students, what they need, interventions, um, modifications to be put in place in the classroom, whether there's a special educator there or not, and just supporting one another. And we're going to continue to work on that into next year. Um, our bridge program has done a great job supporting individual student need. Um, so we have some students who participate part of our language-based program who require more inclusion. For example, they're really strong in math, so they attend uh, general ed math um, actively in the classroom um, with either one of the bridge teachers or a paraeducator, and they're showing success. And then we have other students who require more pullout, uh, specialized reason, reading, for example, and are getting what they need. So it's a very kind of flexible program. Um, we had offered an assistive technology open house um, also for parents. Julie, do you want to sit down? I'm okay. I, oh, no, <laughs> I need to drink a little water anyway, so thank you. Perfect time, see? <laughs> Always supporting me. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some other highlights. So we had an amazing readathon this year at Josh Wheaton. Um, this readathon, our main goal was the love of reading. And so I have to give uh, lots of credit to Jamie Quinn, um, uh, Rachel Hitch, Karen Girardi, um, Katrina Madden, and I, and we all really worked hard, but particularly Rachel and Jamie. <laughs> um, and kids were so enthusiastic about reading. I got so many parent emails about um, how their child, who was a reluctant reader before, because of the readathon, where they would go online and they could log the book they read, and if they liked it, and their favorite part, and they would earn like wisdom coins for their participation. Um, so the students really, um, really drove the love of reading. Um, it was an inclusive school-wide activity. Every student had the opportunity to participate. It was integration of technology, so kids sort of felt like grown up in a way, because they were exchanging conversations with their peers, as well as a lot of the staff and myself. We would go on, we would write comments, or we would like what they said, and it seemed to just like build every day. It was wonderful. Um, and it was a huge fundraiser for Joshua Eaton. So um, at one of your, one of your next meetings, you were receiving um, a significant donation um, from the PTO to JE from this fundraiser. So we're excited. Oh, uh, so principal time. So these are some of my friends who um, earned time with the principal. Um, some students earned it because they uh, won the spelling bee for their grade level. So they had pizza. We ordered pizza. We sat together. Honestly, it was one of the best times I've had this school year. We sat. We chit-chatted. They told me what they like about Josh Wheaton, how they like extended recess and start later in the day. But it was just really great um, to have that opportunity just to sit with kids and talk to them. It was amazing. And then I had two principals of the day. Uh, one principal of the day uh, won a raffle at the Young Women's League. And another principal of the day uh, won a raffle at the Ice Cream Social. And they were so cute, and they followed me around. And we had a great day, and they had a badge. And I saw one of the moms today, and she said, oh, you know what he said to me? You got home? And I said, oh, what did he say? Gosh, she worked so hard. <laughs> and I said, I don't play it for him, too. But it was so cute. They were, they were precious. So this is a student making um, 
the, an, an announcement of the speaker, <laughs> and this is student telling me three things that he likes about Joshua Eaton. So that was precious. And we've been so fortunate through our PTO to have so many wonderful field trips and enrichment. We had uh, NECN come in. Um, it happened to snow that day with, while they were there. So the kids got to go on the truck and explore that. Top Secret Science, Boston Tea Party field trip, um, Stone Zoo field yeah. trip. We are, have fourth graders going to Stonehenge. I mean, the opportunities for our students are amazing to see things that they might not otherwise get to see. So. Uh, we thank our PTO once again. Our open house night, this is just a couple of work samples um, of the creativity that the teachers have to connect um, what the students are learning to a different medium, mostly art here. Our second grade did an amazing wax museum. It was like the talk of the school. Whether you had a second grade or not, you went to the wax museum to see what was going on. And I happened to be sitting at a table that night, and kids would come by and just literally stand in front of me and pretend, and say, hit my button, press my uh, flashlight. It was so cute. Um, but it's just, the building looked amazing, and I loved, and the staff loved how student-centered it was, which is our goal always. And some other fun days at Joshua Eaton, we had walk or bike uh, to school day. Um, the, that's in the ice cream social. There actually should be two more pictures there of the ice cream social, but that's okay. I must have messed that up. And then we have the variety show. The variety show is this Friday night for anyone who's interested at 6.30 at Parker Elementary. And um, our staff appreciation week. I have to, I mean, I keep talking about our PTO. They're amazing and they respect the work of our staff so much. They provided um, us a week full of food and fun and <coughs> most of all, love and respect. And uh, we want to thank them. The staff really, really appreciated that because our staff does work extremely hard. So those are just a couple pictures. I just like to squeeze the staff in when I can. And then looking into the future, we're gonna to continue to fine tune our uh, guided reading and writing block. Uh, we're going to have one of our school improvement goals next year to be around math, about diving deep, looking at the standards and the alignment of our curriculum materials. Um, talk about the sequence vertically and horizontally of the standards in which they're taught. Um, we're gonna to continue to evaluate our consultation time among staff, like everybody's working really, really hard, but we wanna make sure we're working really, really smart in that time. Um, we're gonna introduce some project-based activities on Friday mornings. We're gonna have like a rotating cycle. It's sort of these STEM, SEL activities where we get a whole grade level together. So for example, we get the whole first grade together and we're working on some kind of activity. So we're also building collaboration, teamwork, and having fun when we come to school. And then let's see. Uh, we're going to schedule SST and data team meetings, more regular intervals. Okay. This year it was a little bit challenging. I came in, the schedule was already done. Um, but next year we're going to actually block off um, a certain day of the week or a certain amount of time so that we're on a consistent cycle um, that we hold very valuable, that nothing's going to interrupt. Because we, we have done a lot, I, I want to be clear, we have done a lot of SSTs and a lot of data work this year, um, but it was not, didn't have the flow that we wanted to have, so we'll work on that. And uh, we're gonna continue to strive for a better attendance. So I wanna make sure I take this moment now too. Um, in my first year as Joshua Eaton principal has been an honor and a privilege. Um, it's great to come to work every day and do the job that I love so much that doesn't feel like a job. I wanna thank Dr. Doherty. He has been, I can't say enough about this man. Like he has been a rock to me every single day. I can call him at any time and he is there um, to support me so that I can do the best I can for Joshua Eaton. I also wanna thank the entire administrative team uh, the Joshua Eaton staff, obviously, you know, I, I can't say enough. They're amazing, wonderful group of people. Um, my school council for all of their support, the building leadership team, um, our PTO I keep talking about, all of you. Um, I love when I see you out and about and we have these little side conversations and you're giving me feedback and I so appreciate that because that helps Joshua Eaton grow. And then of course, our parent community. Um, who have such great conversations, reflective conversations, um, in the best interest of kids. So just thank you, everybody. Great job.
questions, Nick? Sure. So, Ms. Polito, thank you. You, you. you inherited a job with adding scrutiny because of past events, and I, from my perspective sitting here, you have handled it incredibly well. You've thank done you. a lot of updates in front of this committee. I've been sitting on the, you know, talking to me from public comment and in my past, and I've, I found that to be an intimidating experience, so I can only imagine how difficult it is. You make it look easy, and I know it's not. Um, so thank you for that. Um, the number in the presentation that really stood out to me was the improved attendance, the, the percent of students with 10 or more absences going down uh, from what, about 25% to under 10, you're down to like 8%. Yeah. That's tremendous, and that, that's a really good use of, you know, kind of looking at where, where can we make the biggest impact right away on students. I think that's fantastic. I, I have kind of a broader question about how you view kind of student well-being within, you know, what you've learned, because you've, you've been, I know, collaborating with all these different perspectives that you have on the thank you slide there. So anything you can tell us from the like kind of the MTSS tier two support world that you know what what have you learned anything about how to focus efforts in ways that you think makes an impact on student learning? And then we have different ways kind of assessing students, right? So we have these internal assessments that we saw the early slides on here. Fox Pinnell is one um, you a number of others, and you, uh, it looks like multiple different ways that you work in the classroom with your teachers to right. and kind of evaluate how students are progressing on the curriculum path. There's report cards. You know, how, how does the report card reflect the level of, you know, is there a correlation that, that should exist between a report card assessment and one of these internal assessments, and lastly, the MCATs, um, whatever we call it now, 2.0 or next generation, whatever it is. Um, so anything, anything you can tell us about kind of filling in the whole picture, MTSS, um, attendance, and MCAS report cards and these internal assessments, what have you learned in, in your last year and what can other elementary schools learn from your experience? Sure. Um, if we talk about the academic side of things, um, I would say that there's a, a lot of, let's say, tier two interventions going on. Um, but I have to say it's not maybe as consistent as we would like it to be at Joshua Eaton, but that's kind of like what we're talking about. It's kind of our work in progress and sharing with one another and collaborating. So who might be doing, for example, progress monitoring um, with this tool A and who's using tool B and then which one is actually giving us the feedback that we want and able to uh, move students forward. Um, the correlation between all those data points, it's challenging because sometimes it's comparing apples and oranges and bananas, right? Um, and so what we want to do is, A, is the child happy in learning? That's our first thing. And then B, looking at individual children, are they growing themselves, right? So these numbers are like this high, you know, 30,000 view, but we're really actually interested in individual children and having those conversations. And those are, um, and that's hard to kind of present like in, in this form here, but when we do gather and meet and talk about kids, we actually break them up into, you know, who are our tier three kids, our most struggling learners, and those aren't always kids on IEPs um, for a specific um, objective or domain, it could be um, different children. Um, it happens to be what is our focus. It happens to be that this year our focus mainly was around literacy, and so that's where we broke literacy apart. And next year we're actually going to dive even deeper. So the teachers keep record already, and that's not presented here, and that is information that in year one that I asked them for. But next year we will actually be breaking reading apart and looking at fluency, comprehension, right? All, breaking reading down, which the teachers already do a great job of, and individually provide that intervention, but we're gonna do that more collectively next year. That's kind of one of our goals moving forward. Um, on the um, social emotional side of things, um, that is kind of why we're doing the work this summer around the um, uh, responsive discipline. Um, we have a lot of great things in place you know, all up and down the tiers, right? But in practice, some of those things aren't working to the degree in which we want them to. And so at Joshua Eaton, though, know, that's the one thing I learned. I learned that this staff is very proactive um, through our communications with them, one another to say, okay, what part of it actually isn't working? So for example, cafeteria has been a little bit of a concern for us at Joshua Eaton because we have a lot of kids in a little space. But what can we do so it doesn't feel punitive? And it's actually shifting behavior rather than you know just spitting out commands. And so we're gonna continue to work to tighten those things up. 
both tier two and level tier three. Great, thank you. Well, so, or just let me ask you. on the slide with uh, on special education, uh, you had the. Uh, are these professional developments that you've already done or stuff that you're look or, or a combination of what you've done and what I'm looking at both. the yes, assistive technology uh, what's that I know what it is but wh yes. what are you doing for that so um, that was something that was put out by our assistive technology teacher for the district okay. she was providing an open house for um, students on IEPs to come and participate and learn more about assistive technology. Um, it is since, I put this presentation together, I found out um, that we didn't have enough interest and so it, it's not actually happening, but we're gonna, I guess, try again in the fall. Okay. Then the other uh, thing, I, I was interested in the, in the looking into the future slide mm -hmm. and you know, I guess maybe this goes to Dr. Dorr. I think this is great, and I mean, not just relative to you, but I'm really interested in something I'm going to be watching uh, in the you know next year, years ahead. Is how much we're collaborating among schools, and and I'm, I'm for for example, I love the idea of the to introduce uh, uh, project based and it. Uh, learning and at this level I mean we're doing it now at the high school level and uh, and I'm hoping that I'm going to hear that we're this is maybe a model that we're doing at all the elementary schools and not uh, Joshua Eaton because I think and I've said it in the past we need to, to share do, do do more of the same at all the schools and do it well you know, do do so, a lot, do some things well everywhere, as opposed to everybody doing something a little bit different. So. And I know that that is happening at some of the other elementary schools already. Um, and I know Heather Leonard, who's taking yep. over the STEM role, um, she and I have already done a little bit of some collaboration on that too. So I think it's going to be amazing uh, for the town of Reading. Thank you. Yes. Um, so just to follow on that, I was going to ask, you know, how are the new curriculum coordinator positions, like what do you see uh, in all those items looking to the future? I would assume that you're looking for those opportunities Absolutely. to leverage and, and, and incorporate them. And I'm really happy to see the focus on the data and, you know, how to, um, how to be just be more effective with the data. So, um, so just a question on the, on the literacy. <laughs> So, and like on the Fontes Pinel, you're talking about, you, there are sort of time frames, and I understand now, like, so at the beginning of the year, there's a certain place at the grade level that you should be. And I remember, by the way, third, I remember third grade with my sons. It's a, such a challenging year, and in the middle of the year, it's like, oh my God, are they ever gonna get it? Right, and so then, pivotal. you know, at the end of the year, okay. You know, and I remember each of the, there are all four of them, and they were all really different, but I, that third grade thing was just like, wow. A, you could really see the um, developmental change, um, and it was different rates. But um, you know, what what do you you know? How do you expect to see that? Do you expect to see that change like next year, like in terms of targets for the the individual grade level, or what does that tell you about? You know, you've got the third graders, and there, and here's where they were. Does that tell you anything about what you expect to see in fall for the them as fourth graders? Like, um, I don't. Well, I think that in the fall, as fourth graders for that current third grade group, yeah. that they'll already have had those experience with, like I talked about, like those higher level questions. So it won't be like they're if this is new to them, right? So their learning experience will all, you know, grow. And I think also, just globally, will we see the kind of that ebb and flow consistently? We may, if I was going to predict, I would say maybe. But I'd also say that we're much more consistent on our instruction at Joshua Eaton in terms of teaching how to answer those uh, higher order questions, right? So these third graders, um, I can't say whether they, I wasn't here, whether they did or didn't, but I know that we started Reader's Workshop um, in the middle of last year, and so they're, they're kind of engaging in those experiences a little bit differently than the kids who are coming after them. Okay. Um, I, I have one other quick thing. Um, I think it's 
so important looking at so many of the things where the community has an opportunity to be involved and to meet the teachers and the staff and the open houses and, and see the work and the interaction. And I think it's so important that we have those opportunities. You know, parents, the percentage of parents that both parents, you know, work outside the home and can really only get to the school for special events or our evening activities, that's their opportunity to act, interact with our teachers and staff. And it's so important that, you know, you do these things and that the teachers are there. And I just really wanted to share my appreciation for, for that and how important that is. And um, if we're going to continue to have a community that understands what it takes to have an excellent school district mm -hmm. for all children, we need to keep that engagement, right? We do not want to be 15 years down the road where we were the last two years. So we've got to keep that engagement because this story needs to keep moving forward. Yeah. So I really appreciate all the teachers that and staff that contribute to that and give the opportunity for parents to um, interact and really see what's going on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you as well for all of the presentations this year. Something I particularly like about your presentations is the balance you create between the data, which I think we need to see and the community needs to see that this is what we're looking at and this is the success and it's a number. You can see, you know, it, it adds, <coughs> I think, weight and um, seriousness to the work you're doing. So I really appreciate that. But I like that you put it in the context of the whole child. And here is the pictures of the work and the activities we're doing and the field trips, because it, it only happens within that context. And I think sometimes presentations veer too much one way or the other, and you really do strike a nice balance. So I really appreciate that. I appreciate that feedback. I do have a question. Sure. Um, the early, um, the earlier slides with the early reading inventories at kindergarten and first grade, the Lexia data. My question is how. How confident are you that this represents 100% of the students at each grade level? So a kid is absent. Great question. Um, and then also included in that question is students in IEPs. Are students in special education programs included in these totals? So these numbers include 100% of the students of Joshua Eaton. The only exception to that is one fifth grade student refused to take the FMP. But besides that one student, this is representative of every single student at Joshua Eaton. Thank you for that. May I ask a sure. another one? Um, this is more of a comment. The, the Fontes and Pinnell data with that grade three thing, which does mm -hmm. jump off the page. Yes. Um, I appreciate that analysis, and I like it. But I'm thinking, as you think about next year and further presentations, it might be interesting to take a cohort of students and follow them from more than fall to spring, because then you might actually see that play out, that, wow, yeah, yeah. You, there is a consistent dip. Yeah. So we um, actually do. So I actually have the data that was um, Mr. Sprong left for me great. for these students from last year. And then I have one grade from actually the year before that. And so we use conditional formatting, so we color code. So I can just kind of like look at the rainbow. I should see a rainbow as I go across. And if I don't, it gives me a stop point to look and say, OK, wait a minute, what happened? in here we all of a sudden had a dip so I'd yeah. be interested to see multi-year data great thank you yes a lot of what I'm thinking in terms of your presentation has already been said thank you it's really nice to have a window into the whole child approach that's happening mm -hmm. at Joshua Eaton um, and the fact that you said that you're looking to make sure the kids are happy and learning and also growing themselves. Mm -hmm. um, it was part of what I wanted to hear, I admit it, um, that that focus is really important. Um, and I wrote it down on the page where um, you have the chart for early, read, old, early reading inventory for the kindergarten. And my question is about the um, hearing, recording sounds and words. Yes. Because I am imagining this task for kindergartners, and I'm imagining my children back in kindergarten, and I'm seeing a deer in headlights. Like, it seems like such a difficult task for, and I understand going from 29% to 86, so I would expect that there's some practice in there that helps oh, them yeah. get used to it. Um, my question is about de developmental readiness, mm -hmm. and for those kids that aren't there, in the spring of their kindergarten year, um, the balance of the stress with those expectations that they should be able to do this in kindergarten versus the reality of a, um, 
the trajectory that some kids don't get there mm -hmm. till first or even my son didn't choose to read till second grade sure. and now he's going to Fletcher <laughs> so um, I just I'm sorry about that little interjection yeah, I'm really proud of him um, but that I, I'm just wondering about that how you balance that pressure and the stress and your focus, which I'm thrilled to hear about, happy and learning and growing. And then I'll add a second question that you sure. can. So the second one's related because I know there's much more entailed in that wax museum description that you did. Mm -hmm. And I'd love, I've been to some of these activities, mm -hmm. but I'd love for people to know what, how fun it is, but also what the kids are learning, mm -hmm. who they're impersonating when they do. Yes the wax figures and what the big picture is about that. Okay, sure. And so then we'll start with the um, hearing sounds and words, um, hearing recording sounds and words. And so um, when this assessment is given, it's given one-on-one, -on -one and it isn't like under a stressful kind of environment like you do this. Um, it's basically the sentence is given and they're practicing writing and where it feels somewhat natural to them is because we're using, using the reader's workshop model at kindergarten at the kindergarten level where they start off by drawing and sketching right they're getting their thoughts out by drawing and sketching and kids like you said developmentally will um, increase you know that output in different ways some kids will continue to sketch and draw some kids will be getting to write like letters on the page and so you kind of go on this developmental trajectory that um, the hope is, and that's why we do the test again in first grade, is to see that growth and development, right? So each child kind of as an individual. And then through that data, seeing who, are, who which students are that 12% who are struggling with that subtest, right? So our eyes are on them. We're like, what do they need? What, what's holding them back, right? And so it's leading us to kind of the question that Mr. Boven asked, like, what intervention might we need to do for them to support them? Are they still just at the sketch stage? Are they writing letters? Are they sort of writing a sentence? Right? What's developmentally appropriate for that individual child at that point in time? So it isn't um, take the test, nothing's done, take the test. There's like a lot, and what I'm saying is very cursory of actually what the kindergarten teachers do in between. Um, but it, it's, um, a lot of learning happening in between but it's also giving us a lot of information so that it doesn't end up that we have children maybe who if we weren't doing this assessment end up further along in the in a certain grade and then we're like wait a minute they can't write a sentence and then there's a problem right this gives us the opportunity to gather the data think about the data where specifically they are at and provide them the intervention they might need Okay, and then um, for the WAC Museum, um, and, and Jamie Quinn's here, and she's one of the second grade teachers, but basically, um, and you can correct me if I say anything, not 100%, um, it's a historical figure, um, or um, a popular figure, and they do research on um, the um, figure that they're representing. They dress up in costume. They a lot of them memorize the scripts. Some kids have like index cards. Um, and it's just Most amazing. of the time they do, they are able to memorize the whole thing. Like, mm -hmm. it is usually they focus on students who've broken, or people who've broken new ground in the world. So it's not just like famous people, but it's people who've made a difference in our world. Mm -hmm. So it could be artists, it could be um, people in NASA, you know, it, there's like a, a whole list that they um, can choose from. And actually, some of them come in with things and people that I've never heard of mm -hmm. because they're so excited about it too. Mm -hmm. But when you walk into the room, it's dark. Um, we actually borrowed it. I'll give Karina Becker a shout out. <laughs> who brought, had the barrels. I learned it there my student teaching, and then we brought it to Eaton. But um, we've done it for about 10 years. But the parents come in. It's dark. Um, the kids are standing around the room. And the parents walk up to them with the flashlight. They turn it on. And then the characters, like wax museum figures, come to life. Oh. And so then they say their speech. And some of them, they, they write their speeches from their research. Some of them will, you know, can modify it and make it a little bit shorter, but it's their words, like they create it from their research. And then, um, go, like, they're able to, you know, add to it. I had one student, when she practiced during the day, I came back at night, she said her speech again for me on a recorder, 
and she had added three lines to it. So um, they just really own it. I think it's one of the yeah. greatest memories of second grade. Yeah. So. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, and uh, being with this talented committee, a lot of what I was wondering has also been asked or said, so thank you, colleagues. Um, so I have a, a somewhat similar question, but I, I was looking at um, these many data points also, the early reading inventory in Lexia, then Fontes and Pinnell, MCAS, and then thinking about local assessments. And so you have some that are kind of summative in some ways, like MCAS is more summative, but you're trying to use many of the others formatively to put in the interventions when they're needed. So, um, I, and I don't know if there's an answer to this, but there are so many um, potential data points, and so how do you take them as like mosaic squares and put them into a comprehensible picture so that they add up to, how do you put the narrative there that you can then act on? So yeah. I have a master tracker, mm -hmm. and so in that master tracker it, um, includes attendance data, includes students on mm -hmm. IEPs, on 504s, ELL, I mean it's a very it goes on and on and on. So there's a lot it. of data points, <laughs> right, exactly. And so, um, oh, and I'm just gonna be honest, when I come to a yeah. presentation of the school committee, I wanna be very respectful of my students that I'm not giving away identifiable, identifying sure. information. Right. So mm -hmm. that's why I kind of stay at that kind of top mm -hmm. level sort of things. Um, but at our data meetings, we, yeah. we break them down. Like we talk about individual questions. Like why is everyone struggling on this question? So. That's one lens that we look at. Another lens we look at is, you know, our students on IEPs. How come in this grade they're growing exponentially, and then another grade right. it's kind of stagnant? And having those kind of conversations, and why is this classroom doing so well with literal comprehension, but then in other classes maybe not so much? And then teachers are sharing. Um, so there's like so much more um, that we're doing. Um, to, like you said, like there are so many different ways to look at it. And data can say, let's face it, data can say whatever you want exactly. it to say. Yes. Right? Um, but what we wanted to say is like what's good for kids and how it are, are all kids feeling, again, happy and successful in their own learning. Yeah, and how do you identify which points are the most significant um, and meaningful? Because mm -hmm. you can get data points that are... Mm -hmm. You could focus on, but then you get a lot of kind of um, scattershot. But you don't want scattershot. You want right. We want very li kind of linear, and, yeah. and it's kind of um, what we were saying. Like all these different tests are like apple, orange, and banana. But yeah. what is a consistent thread through right. all of the assessments? What's like gleaning? What's like what what, what is emerging from that data yeah. that we should be paying attention to? Right? Those are some of the It's an ideas. art and a science, I think, at the same time. It is. It is. You get yeah. lost in it for hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did um, have two, one other um, <coughs> comment and then one other question. So my comment, I want to echo what uh, my colleagues have said too about the importance of fun. I mean, I remember my daughter's first day of kindergarten and she danced her way down the street to school. Mm -hmm. And our mission statement is to um, instill the joy of learning. And so I'm talking about data points and assessment and sometimes that can feel at odds with joy. It doesn't have to. And I'm really, um, it's so meaningful though that people love to learn because that is how they grow, obviously. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but it's so important. And um, like Mr. Robinson said, the project-based learning I think is a wonderful way to instill joy and also that kinesthetic mode of learning that we don't often do enough of. And I'm really happy to hear that's happening you know, at Eaton and at other schools too. So I, one of my questions would be, what do you see for next year um, in terms of, I thank you for the things you've already identified as where some of your areas of focus are gonna be. What other areas of focus do you see um, that you guys want to, as a team, work on? What kinds of supports are you gonna need? What kinds of professional development are you hoping for? Where, where are you headed next? Um, so kind of in general sense, mm -hmm. like even our school improvement plan for this year, I mean, right. it's labeled three points, we're working a lot more than that. Um, while our focus on paper next year will be around math, around um, yep. classroom management, um, to name two, um, still have to talk with the committee to, right. to help focus. I don't ever like to be as what I say is how we're doing it. I like to I put out the information. But we're going to continue to work on literacy. That isn't something that then just falls by the wayside. Right. Um, because we've made a lot of tremendous growth and progress. But we also know, like I said, we have 
some things we need to fine tune a little bit more. I'm going to be working on interventions and what does that look like and how are we keeping it effective for students, um, expanding our data points that we're looking at. Um, mm -hmm. So many things, so many mm -hmm. different things. Um, because you, there, you can't, you, everybody could do a hundred things, mm -hmm. but in the real, but from a practical point of view, you're going to highlight yes. certain ones. Mm -hmm. Like, so it sounds to me like deeper dive into literacy, if I'm hearing this mm -hmm. right, the math, the math. kind of where you are now with the math, with the literacy, going into that with the math, with the math. and then mm -hmm. more um, of the kind of behavioral mm -hmm. that like cuts across. Restorative justice, responsive discipline, yes. um, classroom management, kind of all. And then I'm guessing too those interventions that um, help with students mm -hmm. who are struggling, not struggling, special ed, not special ed, but integrating Integrated. the mm -hmm. um, interventions of all kinds. Yeah. Okay. And so we're very fortunate that we have many yep. different types of like groups that meet together. So we have mm -hmm. grade level teams that meet. We have building leadership team. We have school council teams, and so many hands make light work. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of want to do things like you're saying. We want to do things well and not just make a list of, oh, here's all right. the things we want to improve. Because any improvement is going to take three to five years right. for being realistic mm -hmm. and honest with ourselves. And you want but it to be nice, sticky. You want it to hold. We to want it stay. to hold. We yeah. want it to be a habit. We want yep. it to be a behavior, Joshua Eaton, in our systems of the way that we right. do business. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I just had a quick follow-up on Ms. Borowski's point before, and just some, um, just two quick observations I haven't heard yet. Uh, one on Ms. Bresky's point, I, I think she was talking, you were talking about longitudinal data, like seeing how a cohort progresses. I, I totally agree. I think it's a great point. If we could see, you know, to the, for, for many, any of the elementary schools, you know, how, how are cohorts of students progressing through the grades? It, it means a lot more to me than seeing snapshots in some ways because you're not seeing the effect of the effort that we're making to develop students. You just kind of say, well, this cohort is at this particular um, assessment level at this time where seeing either improvement or seeing the need for improvement is going to you're going to see it year over year with the same kids so I, I really like that idea anyway you can show that two separately the second point two observations from looking at different snapshots I've seen at different times of, of all the elementary schools it's not Joshua in specific um, we had a presentation earlier this year where we talked about the MCAS 2.0 whatever results and one of the one of the trends that I remember seeing and it was just something to pass on that we had discussed in a separate meeting, but it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't about Joshua Eaton. It, it seemed that in grade five, there was a drop off in, in every subject tested that you would have. Grade four, three, four, you would see improvement and a drop off relative to peer set statewide. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a bit of a puzzle to me why that would happen across the whole, all five elementary schools. Just something to look for, and I, I don't know if it's in your dashboard or if it's something you see, but it's something in an aggregate we see, and I don't know if that's, you can go back and look at your dashboard and see whether there's, I don't know why that might be. It could also be like in the third grade point we talked about, where you hit an inflection point in learning and there's always uh, an adjustment period, I, I don't know. Um, and then the other thing I've noticed in the elementary school data that I see, and I see it in various you know, elementary schools, I see it in various cuts of the data, various subjects, even last year versus this year, is a relatively large number of our students sitting right below meets the standard. Mm -hmm. We don't have a large number of students in like really far away from the standard on the low end, mm -hmm. like whatever that we call that category. Right. We have very few, like five percent or less. But we, in, in some schools, in some subjects, it's almost a third of our students. Not in every school, in every subject, but so it can be 20, 30 percent. Why? Right, and, and so that's just, just a question. I don't have an answer. It's just something as you go through the dashboard and we're talking about data, those two things, grade five drop off and students kind of camped at just, just below that meeting the standard and what can we do to help bring those students, and I know assessment is, is, has multiple parts to it and that also goes for attendance, it also goes for um, second, third tier supports, trying to you know, wean students off of those to just be in tier one over time. Uh, but we hadn't talked about that yet, so. But you're right, because actually if I go back to that third grade data and I look at the group that's called approaching, 7% of the kids who are right on the cusp of those 7% move forward, then we'd be talking a difference of 1% from fall to, right. to um, the spring data. So you're right. So that's kind of the work of like digging deeper. Like what is it that makes them hang out there? On the that's right. so, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Good job. Oh, yes. I have one more question. The discussion of cohorts just um, 
reminded me of my other question. One of the questions, we are going into the kindergarten presentation, and one of the questions that we're often asked is about full day and half day mm -hmm. kindergarten and how that plays out or doesn't play out over time. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you're also collecting that data over time and if you've seen differences um, in the, the assessments that you're doing between those that go for half time mm -hmm. and those that go for full day. I don't have exact numbers or trends, so I'll speak kind of generally. We do notice in some students who are half day are performing slightly lower than those students who are performing, um, who are attending full day. Um, so we had a couple of our students who attended half day who are now, um, maybe middle of the year, started attending full day, and we've seen tremendous growth. Um, and not that, you know, it's like this intensive teaching that happens in the afternoon, but it's the structure of the school day. It's um, maybe oh, yeah. different hands-on activities around science and social studies. Maybe an interest level is raised um, that engages kids more, um, access to higher level vocabulary through those activities. But um, that's like, I don't have like specific data, but um, yes, we do see a little, a little difference. In over years? Do you have um, I don't know over years. I don't have that no, data. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, I don't Thank know you. that we want to get the Lido to draw value judgment. Yeah, I, I, don't, on that. I don't mean yeah. to. I'm just wondering if it's no, being don't. collected. Yeah, so that was kind of like the best answer to give. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thanks to all the staff. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. very much Thank you. for coming. Linda, is everything okay? Thank you. So when we had a discussion um, about kindergarten, um, both in February and in March, uh, one of the things I know that the committee wanted to do is get a, have a follow-up uh, in June. So that's why we're having this presentation now. Um, so I just want to recap first what is happening for next year, and this is none of this is different from uh, what we discussed in February and March. So we're going to have separate full day and half day kindergarten programs. Um, there are going to be no integrated classrooms for next year. Um, the full day kindergarten is going to be offered in all five elementary schools and the half day program uh, will be in three schools, Killam, Joshua, Eaton, and Wood End. And that's really due to, a, and I'll show you some numbers uh, on a couple slides about that the, we are seeing a, a lower and lower enrollment of our half day half-day half programs. So Barrows and Joshua Eaton half-day students are going to attend Joshua Eaton. Killam and Birch Meadow are going to attend Killam. Um, Birch Meadow and Wood End will attend Wood End. I believe we only have one Birch Meadow student uh, at this time going to, to Wood End. Um, the other thing that I think is important is that if there are siblings um, that are in half-day now, uh, next year, if they're in half-day next year, that in grade one they will go back to the school where their brothers and sisters are. And that's something that we talked about um, in February and March. Um, there were some half-day parents that uh, decided, who had siblings at a, at a school, uh, that decided to go to full day. So we gave them um, the option of going to full day, which they, uh, they did take advantage. And we had several to do that. Um, some of the other things that, uh, and this, this slide's a little bit different from what's in your packet, because uh, I've got some additional information this afternoon. So um, 
The half-day kindergarten programs at Eaton and Killam are going to start at 815. This is to allow families that may have children in both schools the ability to drop off one child and then drop off another child. Um, we are also going to offer uh, supervision at, before school uh, for those Birch Meadow and Barrows kindergarten half students who are going to be attending Killam or Eaton. The other piece, which is new, is on Wednesdays, and this is something that, you know, these are the little logistical things that you discover as you go through the kindergarten screening process and you're getting closer to the time, is that um, we would have had a little bit of an issue um, on Wednesdays at quarter of one. So we are going to provide supervision uh, on Wednesdays until one o'clock at Eaton and Killam to allow those families that may have children at other schools to um, to be able to get there in time to, to pick up their children. So, so that's one slight change from what you saw in the fall. Um, and then as we talked about before uh, in February and March, um, so we're going to take a look at all of our grade one numbers um, in the 1920 school year um, as we're going through the process to make sure that uh, the siblings obviously are going to go back to their schools if, if they haven't already. Um, and then the next priority will be geographic proximity. Obviously the goal is, is to allow any student that's at the school now to stay there, but we also want to keep class size um, as in mind as well and try to stay within those guidelines of 18 to 22 in the, in the early uh, primary grades. So those are, those are all things that have been discussed um, in the only change was that Wednesday piece. The other piece we've talked about in the past, and I just want to make the committee aware, is the census is not an accurate predictor. Um, it's off always. Uh, sometimes it's off a little bit, sometimes it's off a lot. Uh, it is not an exact science. There are families that do hold their child back a year from kindergarten, um, which we can't capture in a census. We don't know that at the time. Uh, there are families, obviously, that move in that their child is not registered in the census, and those those are things we, numbers we don't have. So, so for example, for this year, the census that we had in last July for this upcoming kindergarten year was at 315. And our enrollment right now is at 329. Now, some of these numbers, just so you know, so Barrows and Birch Meadow, that's the enrollment that's going to be there next year, but that's only full day. So there is some slight variation, um, and this was the geographical location um, of the students based on you know where they live and what the traditional boundaries have been. So, but the numbers you can see at the bottom are still higher uh, than the census, census originally predicted. Next year's census right now for 2019-20 school year, you can see we're at 320, uh, where we do have a large number of students that are in the Barrows District um, and the Killam District. So obviously those are things we have to keep an eye on um, as we go through this can process. I, so I didn't know what the we. Can I ask a question? You You're the chair. The <laughs> so you said that's only full day, okay? The three. No, no, that's the current. That's the 2018-19 is the current enrollment. No, no, no. I'm looking at uh, the 329 figure. Is that? No, that's total. That's okay. That's a, that's all that's students. Not, I thought you just said that it was. Only no, what I was saying is Barrows and Birch Meadow. That's the enrollment there for next year. But remember, they don't have right, half-day students. Right, right. So that so that's what we would be somewhat looking at for the first I'm thinking of the first grade year it's correct be, that class is correct be a class that's really correct bad. now something that has not been decided yet with these numbers is we are still there are still some students that may be assigned um, and there are IEP meetings going on right now yeah. to special education programs in another school so that's happening right now so some of these numbers may change a little bit within the 329 um, and those will be going on right till the last day of school I'm assuming right Carolyn yeah um, those those team yes. meetings yes. I guess one other yeah. census related item there is a lot of housing inventory three and four bedroom homes if you drive around Reading and you look and you're looking at real estate 
There's a lot of houses for sale right now. It's a little, it's a little frightening to me. Um, you know, if those turn over and people already are bringing their kids with them instead of growing their family for, for a couple of years, because it, you know, because then we we have no visibility versus if they're already here before they start having a family. And, and to that point, the, the reason why I'm showing this slide is because each year is a new puzzle. Uh, yeah. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, there is no pattern to this. Um, I wish I could look into a crystal ball and say where the kids are living and where, you know, where they're going to go and how many are going to choose full day and how many are going to choose half day. But we never know that until December of the year that they're a previous to their coming in. Mm -hmm. So every year it's, it's, a, it's a new puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and if you look in the packet, um, and I think this, the, when the committee gave me the ability several years ago to um, be able to move students geographically that were entering in kindergarten, you can see the enrollment, which is in here somewhere. Is that Siri? Sounds like there's a read, read feature. I'm trying to shut it off and look up something, a, a kindergarten number, I think. So, um, you could see the chart that's in your packet that if you look at grades one through five, for the most part, we've done everything we can to keep it within those guidelines that the school committee has given us. And that is because we've been able to, over the years, balance the schools geographically when we have either new families entering, so when they move in, or with the kindergarten class. So the first year may not always look the same, but when you when you play it out, this is now over several years of having that ability to balance the class sizes, which has always been a priority for the school committee. And that's not something that ever changes. I mean, how is this? I mean, we want people to move to our community. Uh, absolutely. Yes. And, you know, so you know, that's just something we got to right. deal with. Yeah. That's what I'm just saying. It's a new yeah. puzzle every year. Yes. Yeah, but and yet the other chart that's in the budget book, but it's not here, is the last, I think it's 10 to 15 years of data on kindergarten enrollments, and we're nowhere near a maximum on that list, right? We're somewhere around the median if you look at the last 15 years. I mean, it is a puzzle every year. It is unpredictable. You're right, 315 versus 330, that's an average of three extra kids per school. And I understand there's classroom constraints that we'll get to, but we're not in uncharted territory. We're well within a standard deviation of the median of the last 15 years of kindergarten enrollment. We're not wildly high, right? Enrollment's not the issue. It's space. No, no it's it's ready. the number of students no. that choose full day over full half day. Full day over half day. That's, 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 that's the variable. Dramatically, yeah. Yeah. It's but not, the total, I, I totally agree with you. It, the yeah. enrollment has yeah. stayed enrollment fairly consistent. Enrollment it's flip flop. Exactly it's now. the half day, and I'm going to show you we'll a chart yeah. that okay. shows you that. All right. Um, so this is, this is next year's enrollment as of uh, May 29th. Um, you can see our half-day programs are going to be at three schools, and right now the class size, they're all in the morning, which I know is something that parents prefer. Um, and so right now you can see they're at Eaton, Killam, and Wood End. There are 42 half-day students right now. Anyone that's moving in um, is, if they want full day, they're on a waiting list, um, and they're being assigned to a half-day program. Um, at either Eaton, Killam, or, or Wood End. Um, you can see the full day numbers, which we're at 287 uh, for a total of 329. The full day class sizes right now are ranging between 20 and 21, and the half day class sizes you can see are uh, between 8 and 17. So it's the imbalance of Correct. proportions that's, Correct. that's what's new. Correct. From going from going 20% backwards. when it first started. Yeah. It's, it's flipped. Selected. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to show you that. that there's a chart I'm going to show you that shows that. Yeah. Um, we've also increased the number of classrooms that we're going to need uh, for next year because our enrollment did increase from uh, this year to next year. Uh, so this year we have 14 kindergartens. We're now going to be going up to uh, 15 and a half, which is 16. Um, it's actually 17 classrooms because you have three half. classrooms that you're going to need for, for half day, top of the 14. Mm -hmm. right. So just a little bit on research in full day K, because um, I know this, we've been discussing this in the past. There's an awful lot of research on the value of full day kindergarten. Um, but what the research shows is that you have, uh, you know, it boosts student achievement, it closes the achievement gap, 
um, it improves social, student social emotional skills to sound investment. <laughs> Teachers prefer it and full day kindergarten is an option for parents. And as we can see in the numbers that I'm, I think is in the next slide, no, not yet, but you're gonna see that there's a growing trend in Reading where parents are preferring the full day kindergarten. Uh, there are currently 283 communities in Massachusetts that offer tuition free full day kindergarten. And then you could see that the remaining below that, Reading is in the 31 communities that um, are in the 3500 to 4570 range. Um, so we're in the, eight, there's 8.8% 8 .8, 8 .8 of the communities that are in that range. But the vast majority of the communities in Massachusetts now offer tuition free full day kindergarten. In order to do that in Reading, it would require an additional million dollars in the budget. Yep. Um, just to put that into perspective. All right. Can you go back to that other, the one before that? This one? Oh, yeah. The, were you, the last bullet says full day is optimal for parents. Who drew that value? Is that based on a survey question? That's, that's based on the, this research on, from this source, oh, which from is, that source. yeah, from that source. Not, not me. <laughs> so the context of the problem that we have is we have a, we've had tuition based full day kindergarten since the five, six school year. Um, we started with one classroom in each school. Um, this is pre Wood End coming online. Um, and pre-Barrows being renovated. Um, since, since then, we've seen an increase of families requesting full-day kindergarten, starting at 32%, and now it's up to 87% next year. Um, and as I said earlier, we have 42 students in half day. And then because of budget and space limitations, we've had to sometimes create integrated classrooms. Um, and you saw and what happens there is that in an integrated classroom, uh, the half-day students uh, leave at 11.30 when the full-day students go to lunch. Um, the majority of the literacy and math is taught in an integrated classroom in the morning. And then in the afternoon, what is happening is there's a lot more follow-up to the morning activities and there's some additional activities that go on, hands-on activities in, in the afternoon in an integrated program. Um, the other thing that, as you, we've talked about during the budget process, is that families on free and reduced lunch do have the ability to access full day K. Although I'm going to show you an interesting slide, which I'm still trying to figure out why is the case, and we're going to certainly do some more digging on that. Um, and it's either at no tuition or redu reduced tuition. So in writing the priorities for kindergarten that the guidelines that I have followed over the years, which has been what the school committee is, has, guide, has, has directed me to, is to give families access to full day kindergarten, to maintain class sizes in that 18 to 22, um, if possible, keeping half and full day classes separate, not integrated, keeping siblings in the same school, which is they're kind of polar opposites of each other, um, and also maintaining neighborhood schools. So obviously the last three create conflict when you're trying to reach the first two. The limitations to what we're trying to do, as I mentioned earlier, it's a big puzzle. Um, we have five elementary schools, which is a large number for a community the size of Reading. So your economy of scale automatically now diminishes. When you have four elementary schools for us, for a community our size, it's easier to, to uh, create class size balance um, because you have more in a grade, more classes in a grade. So when you only have three or two or four um, in a grade, it makes it more challenging uh, when you have them spread out among five schools. Um, if you have a low enrollment for half day, you have situations in some buildings where you may have too few students to run a class, uh, which by itself, so that, that creates also, um, it's a resource constraint and a space constraint. Um, and then the space piece, is, as we talked about earlier, is, is something that we have, we have struggled with. And it's not just the kindergarten,
piece that creates the space constraints. Um, because of the strength of our special education programs, we have grown in the number of those programs over the years in our elementary. I mean, when I first started um, several years ago, we had one program in the district, and now we're up to nine or 10. Um, uh, and all of those require, requ require space. Um, so it's a combination of all of these things that, that give you your space limitations. Can, before you change, can you go back to the, the, the next slide before that? Just something that keeps coming up and uh, the uh, third bullet down. I mean, we, we have not, as a committee, had a substantive conversation about integrated versus them. We haven't. And, Correct. And it could come up again in the future. Uh, I think we need to have that, because I'm hearing anecdotal comments that from committee members or teachers that it's not a good, why. I want, I want a presentation on why it's not okay. a good uh, model, just because I, I, it could come up again that we need to do it. Uh, and we could uh, do, we yeah. may be doing it in 1920. Yeah, so uh, and I want to be prepared to make that decision uh, whether we, we shouldn't do it or, or whether you know, we should move forward with it. Thank you. Yes? I'm a little confused with that because we actually had a very strong letter from the kindergarten teachers about the integrated day program and that specifically it why it me. wasn't optimal. That doesn't do I want a, I want a presentation on it from the, uh, the superintendent and or the teachers. It's a letter uh, I'd like to talk about. That's all I'm saying. Well, I, yeah. I think the point is that it, as you go down the road, we will be in these situations where we're, we may be faced with, because of space or other constraints, again, said, well, our choice here is to integrate it. And like right now, we have a classroom, a half day classroom of eight, right, at Wood End. Right. Because we've made that choice. We have made that choice to say, we want to keep them separate. We heard a lot from teachers and, and, and parents this year, right? So we've, we've done that. And that means we have. Um, but we, that we was have, in the context of a. Of a, a very rigorous discussion about right. what we were going to do. Right. I'm just saying we, uh, the point that you're making is we should have a more formalized discussion on it because we may be faced with making that decision. And we guidance. Don't know. I mean, right. so that we can come up with guidance like we've done for uh, you know class sizes, like we've done for other things up there. I mean, I want to be more prepared to absolutely move down that road if we have. Yes. Um, and, and to add to that, I'm wondering too about um, what order the priorities should go in. And I'm, I'm guessing that there's an optimal order for them, but it might shift from year to year. Yeah. And I think that might be part of the committee guidance as well. I mean, I agree that these are the priorities we've talked about, but might it be that four some years would supersede three or five would supersede another one? So that's what I'm I, just if I could mm, yeah. comment on that, sure. uh, it, the comment I made earlier about being a big puzzle yeah, is exactly. going to determine really what the order is. I agree. Is. I agree. <laughs> I agree. That's why it can't just be locked in stone right. altogether, but we ha I think it needs to be discussed. So. Mm -hmm. Let's get through the presentation. Oh, you want to go through the presentation and then whole questions? Well, I didn't so know. Did you have a comment? I, I just had a question. It was it was more on the slide after this about rise, and mm -hmm. I'm hearing how many how, how many classrooms has rise grown by in the past years? Because now it's it's at Wood End. And I'm hearing is it at another elementary school now too? In order yeah, to, yeah, yeah, to we moved we moved a classroom to kill them next year to, to accommodate the kindergarten. kindergarten. Right. Oh, okay, so we have nine means. we have nine rise classrooms. So how much how many did we have a few years ago? That sounds like a big. But it's problem. based on the needs of the we have we have certain guidelines that we have to follow by regulation, and you have to have a certain balance of um, regular education students and special education students. So we have a growing number of special education students. So in order to that, you have to have to balance. So, right. Are we doing the, the bare minimum of the requirement or some, like what is the purport? I thought it had to be 50-50 or something. 51-49. 51-49. Are we exceeding that with more regular education? So the, the tricky part about 
rise is that you always have to have slots available during the year because when they turn three is when students start getting services. It's not like kindergarten that there is a cutoff date of August 31st. So we always have to have some flexibility in our slots. So there's, is there any way, like the modulars seem like they have been a very good solution for adding space in the kindergarten. Is it way out of left field to say, oh, you could put, I'm not saying take your parking spot, but like some modulars out there to help with the rise space crunch so they're not taking as much for the elementary? Because that sounds like with the special ed programs that need the mandated space at elementary for the K to five grades, if, that, and you need the rise space, you're running into a, a rise space crunch too. You, you also need space for, rise is also, for some students, is mandated. You need you need to have those services. For uh, right. I'm just saying, is it, it seemed like the, could is that allowable in, in the future if we needed to add modulars out here or something to to supplement rise? That's a, a big yeah, that's a bigger yeah. that's a well, bigger discussion. Think, I think. Thinking about the space to keep it If, the if you want me to continue, yeah. Yeah. Sure. okay. So um, this is. Uh, in, there's a couple of reasons why I created this chart. One is uh, I wanted to show you how the percent has increased in full day over, over the years. And that next year we're at 82.9%. But the other piece, as I was putting this together, is which was, which was eye-opening to me, was the economically disadvantaged column. Mm -hmm. And we offer tuition, either tuition relief uh, through no tuition or reduced tuition for mm -hmm. any economically disadvantaged student. But as you can see, the percent of economically disadvantaged and the total percent are not the same. In fact, the economically disadvantaged one should be closer to 100%. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we're going to have to take a look at, and I don't know if it's partly because students are not identified at the time that um, when they're enrolling in kindergarten, or if there are other, if, if the tuition that they do have to pay still is not affordable, or if there are uh, extended day uh, issues as well, because extended day does not follow the same, because um, they have to apply through the child care circuit through the state to get relief for, for tuition for extended day. It's a different, different set of rules. So those are all variables that we have to take a look at. Um, to see why our economically disadvantaged are not taking full advantage of the full day opportunity. Um, the, for the most part, though, the other percentages, the high needs, well, the high need needs includes the economically disadvantaged. Um, some of our other numbers, the students with disabilities have stayed fairly consistent and actually higher than, in most cases, uh, over the years than the uh, total percent so that over the and I'm looking more at the last five six years because the state data they weren't collecting accurate data or these categories prior to the last five years so that's why you see a lot of NAs um, and we over over the time so the options and I think this speaks to your point earlier you know, the options for the future are really going to be based on space and enrollment, and each year is going to be different. So offer full day and half day kindergarten separately in each school. Offer full day in each school and half day in schools where space is available and enrollment is optimal. Or offer integrated kindergarten in schools where feasible and full day and half day kindergarten where feasible. I mean, essentially that's, and you know, it's all going to always depend on space. Um, availability and the number of students that are participating in full day and half day. If we do not continue to offer full day kindergarten without the limitations, so here's, here's some of the caution and I know that this was some discussion in March about this. Um, <clears throat> if we go to a lottery system, there are still going to be families that need full day kindergarten that did not get it they will go to private kindergarten. What that means is they'll be coming back in first grade. So in first grade, we're going to have the space crunch and that type of um, those limitations that we are experiencing now in kindergarten and are able to, to address them. The other piece that I'm concerned about is those students lose a year of our curriculum. 
And a private school curriculum is not the same as, as, our, as our curriculum. They don't need to follow the curriculum frameworks, and that's a year that they do not have access to services, to curriculum, or, or any of the other things that we offer. Um, so that is always a concern if a family leaves and then comes back in grade one. Um, there will be a financial impact to the budget. Right now we do take, I believe it's 980,000, I should have checked, <laughs> but um, because we did increase the offset um, uh, as part of the budget change in, in February. Um, about a $980,000 offset to the budget. If you go to a lottery, that's less tuition coming in, which means you have to do a decrease to your offset, which is going to mean um, a reduction in teaching and paraeducator staff. It isn't always a one-for-one, -one, um, because we, when we calculate the tuition, it's a piece of different people's salaries, like the principal, like the nurse, like um, even, I believe, central office, um, because there's a piece and we, there's a formula that we can use. So it isn't necessarily a one-to-one. -one. So you will end up, we will end up making more cuts um, de depending on that. So it's something that the committee has to keep in mind if we go to a lottery, which will result in um, a reduced to, uh, offset to the budget. So that's. Any questions from the committee? Yes. Thank you. Um, I want to make a point publicly that I, you may have hit it, and I just didn't hear it, but I okay. think it's salient to this discussion. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with my understanding is that there are some kindergartners who, through their IEPs, require full day kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add that to yep. the discussion. Yes, I did not say that. I yep. apologize. And yep. it's, it's, it's another, <laughs> as you said, another piece to the puzzle um, that I've certainly heard from some people in the community we should just not offer full day K. What they're missing is that we have students who are federally mandated to receive it, and if we don't have the program in district, we have to pay for out-of-district tuition, transportation. It's enormously expensive, So, as well as being bad for students, first and foremost, educationally. Ideally, we want to keep in district. Um, and I think generally speaking, and looking to you, Ms. Wilson, the requirement would be that that would be in an integrated setting, quite like RISE Preschool. Yes. So yes. similarly, we can't yes. only offer it for those students right. because that doesn't right. fulfill the, the federal mandate. Right. So we just wanted to add that kind of to the okay. to the need for it in our district. Um, I did have a question, um, comment, two comments. One is um, I'm as interested as you were in the data on economically disadvantaged and other high need subgroups and I'm thrilled to hear that you're looking into it. I'm, I'm just going to be looking to hear more. It sure. sounds like a tough nut to crack but a really important one. My sense from the research I've seen is that some of those populations are the ones that most benefit from full day K. So I think if we can get at um, that enrollment that would be really beneficial for student learning. Um, the last thing, last point I want to make is around communication. Um, I sort of touched on this but I think the key moving forward with both future incoming kindergarten classes and this year's kindergarten classes, they transition into first grade, is to find a way to communicate all of the variability in the, in the process and then explain why. Explain those five priorities. This is what we're trying to achieve and it necessitates this variability. <coughs> so that's just some guidance. Thank you. Yes. Well, I, I want to thank you, Dr. Gardy, for putting this slide deck together. Um, I just want to be, make sure that we're clear about what the, um, I don't know, what some of the rules of the road here are. Um, I, I think this is an area that really works best in collaboration. This is something I had asked for and probably others did too, this open discussion, because this is, first of all, I, I want to emphasize, this is an administrative question, right? So this school board is, does, we do three things, you know, administration is not one of them, right? We do budget, we do evaluate the superintendent, uh, we do policy. Um, and I think this is an opportunity to have an open discussion about guidance for the superintendent. But this is, this is the superintendent's area of, of expertise. And it is, you know, it's not like we're some appeals board and the public can come to us and say, I don't like what school my kid went to. That's not what we do. Uh, only we set policy in the superintendent. This is not a question of the superintendent not following policy, perhaps interpreting policy, clarifying it. Um, so I want to be clear about that. So I, I, we don't have to have this discussion, and I appreciate you being willing to have it publicly because I think as elected representatives of the public, it's helpful for the public to see us asking questions, you know, in, in an open way on an issue that drew a lot of public attention. But this is your area of expertise, for the superintendent, and we appreciate, you know, that you've done a remarkable job balancing class sizes over 
many years, and, and it is a difficult puzzle. Um, secondly, the legal requirements, we're required as a district to offer two things, right? Meet IEPs, which may include full day ed, right? And, and we have to have the classroom spaces that we uh, talked about earlier to the extent that that's required for IEPs. So we've got to do that first as a district. <clears throat> then the second thing we have to do is offer half day for everybody else. Right? We don't have to offer full day, but we recognize the benefits of it. And you had some, some scholarship up there, and there's certainly a, a lot of sources of, um, of, of the hypothesis that students benefit from more full day. There's one piece that we haven't talked about much before. I was wondering if we could back up to the money slide, um, where you had this, this and you don't have slide numbers here, but it's status of full day kindergarten in Massachusetts. Oh, yeah, the tuition slide. Yeah. So I just I, I just questions about there. this slide and then pairing that with the priority slide that you have two slides later, right? Um, so we charge a lot. This is you know we're 120 bucks from apparently the maximum in the state. Um, we're in the above the 90th percentile in terms of what we charge uh, parents to send their kids to full day K. Um, the committee had an option twice to, we twice deliberated uh, override proposals openly in public. At no time do I remember subsidizing kindergarten being a proposal that anybody It was, was, in, was the it? First it was in the was it? October 2016. The, the 2016 one. No, but not this year. Yeah, yeah, right, it was a That's million right. dollars. That's right. It's a mill a million or, or a partial subsidy. So if you have 287 kids and you, you want to subsidize it down to a level that's the first row there after, if you want to get under $3,000 in reading, it's about 1000 bucks per kid. It's pushing 280 to 300000 right? So it, well, we just we never discussed it in this round of the override. Just one thing of course. about the fee. So yeah. When we first set the fee, we were, um, we were among the lowest. I think what has happened, some of those 283 communities that mm -hmm. figured out how to fund it, you know, that had their overrides and funded it where specifically, yep. they were charging a lot more because we didn't, we were not at the top. Well, we don't so, know whether it was overrides. It could be a myriad of reasons. Right. Could well, be less it's special state. ed programs. We've, we've been right. Uh, we've been waiting for the state to step up, and they're not. Yeah. So it, it, right, and I think as there one, have as one thing. Yeah. There have been school committee discussions about state subsidies around that right. in the past. Right. I know, I know that's that's something that didn't materialize. But anyway, we are where we are. We we charge yeah. an ex comparatively, in my view, exorbitant amount. I understand why um, from the way the budget is calculated, but it's it's also a decision that is a budget decision that this committee has made in aggregate over time uh, to land us here. So again, not the superintendent's fault. Right? We've, right. We, we bear um, accountability Sorry. for that. Uh, and we have a budget every year, right? So we'll, we'll deliberate as a committee every year what should be in the budget, and, and that's coming in, in January. So moving forward two slides now. So that's where we are in the, you know, we charge a lot. This last 1.5 on the priority. So what I don't see up there that I feel very strongly about is maintaining tuition-free access to neighborhood schools. And my view, my, my personal view is that what, what, what troubles me about this whole question of how do we allocate resources to, on the one hand, provide as much full-day kindergarten access as we can to students, of course, you know, let's say just beyond meeting our legal requirement to the IEP students who have that as a requirement for the IEP. That's I'm not talking about that cohort of students. Just the students that are we want to give the option of going to full day. Balancing access by having the classrooms available versus access to a neighborhood school that quite frankly people have just voted themselves an increase in cost to access. We're all paying higher taxes now if we're paying property taxes. And so to me that that doesn't sit well to have guidance that doesn't prioritize it's part of the puzzle and it's the superintendent's expertise but for me an important principle is everybody paid for their local neighborhood schools they pay for them every year they should have access to them without paying what I view as an access fee of almost 5,000 bucks so that to me is troubling even though I see the benefits of full day uh, I'm, I'm bothered by that so um, the other thing that I think moving kids in half-day programs to other schools that aren't their neighborhood schools does is you start the kid off making a, a group of friends and then you move them back to another school the second year for at least for first grade and you have parents who are forming a network many of them for the first time with other um, you know kind of other classmates of their children you start that process at a school one year in kindergarten if you're a half-day parent and then you have to restart the process if you go back to your neighborhood school, or you pay 4,500, 5,000 bucks to avoid all the trouble. That all bothers me, it doesn't sit well. So 
I would include that as a priority. I would rank it very high in my list of priorities, but I'm interested in what the committee thinks of that. I, I think that's a discussion that Chairman Robinson indicated You know, we would have. I, I don't know that that's a discussion for tonight. I mean, I could give you my opinion about whether I agree or disagree with that, but I'm pretty sure that that's sort of what Mr. Robinson was saying, that we should have really a more formal presentation and then really look at you know, what are these um, guidelines that we support um, and, you know, and how they need to be, um, you know, do they need to be fluid or are they going to be, you know, hard and fast? We want one above the other at all costs. We have to agree with that and understand what that cost would be. Because, again, if we say that, then there's other things in other parts of the district that we're not going to do. So I, I think that's a discussion that Mr. Robinson alluded to we need to have after a presentation. If I can just, the discussion that needs to be connected with it is integrated versus right. not. Right. Because right. the two work together. Right. If you're going to have half day programs in all five schools, yeah. you either are going to have integrated or you're going to have a classroom which potentially could have a small number of kids in it. Yeah. Right. And that's so to me, it's the integrated discussion that you need to have. Which is what I. Yeah, we should have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Yes. I just want to follow up on that. Um, this is a discussion I would be interested in having um, down the line. And I would add, Ms. Webb, you just sort of articulated two possible paths. I see a third path, which isn't that these are the priorities and they are rigid and work within these priorities in this order, no matter what the outcome is, or more fluid situation. It also could be a little bit of both. I could see a scenario where we take two priorities, and for, for me, maintaining class size would be my number one. So you say this. You know, above all else, these two are what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And then there are three or four, maybe five other priorities. And in an yeah. ideal world, you do it all, but they fall below these two, which we really feel very strongly about. So it, they might mm -hmm. be very rigid, they might be very fluid, or it might be a couple, small number of very yes. rigid, and a larger number of more fluid if right. the world were ideal. So just another thought. Mm -hmm. Sherry had a question. Um, oh, did you have, you had I do, I do, but that's, um, if, okay. Um, so I just also, so I, on the Mrs. Browski train here, I'll ride, it, I'll ride that to another station too, about the, the communication in the sense that as a parent, you know, I think that one thing I learned myself through the process in the fall was that we have parents who had, it, had the, uh, the kindergarten situation was one way when they started, so they assume it's gonna be the same way, or they're brand new to the system. And so even if we've heard it, 80, 18 times a parent, families coming in are hearing it for the first time. So I do agree that um, is, is kind of as much as we can do with two-way communication, proactive communication, making sure people know to come to those meetings. Um, I really am, I really do think that is super vital because especially where it's a fluid situation and where the, dyna the um, models could change every year and there isn't gonna be, this is how we do kindergarten in Reading. It's going to be a huge challenge, I think, for our district on communication. So I agree with that. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, picking up again on this mm -hmm. continuing discussion, the other idea, I, I, I agree that the integrated or not integrated is driving this, right? Combined with the, the, um, the growing um, disproportionate full day enrollment. Um, one way to come at this might be, and I'm fine with having a full presentation on that, and I think we should, to, to the chairman's point, I'd, I'd like to see a, a substantive discussion of, yes, as um, Dr. Snow Doctor has brought up, we did have some evidence of uh, t you know, a, a teacher's letter to us, and that's helpful feedback, and that's real. I don't want to discount that about a view about uh, preferring, I believe it was the non-integrated to the integrated model. Um, but I think a, f a fuller discussion for, for this committee with different perspectives for me would also be helpful. And then if we think of the committee as there's six of us, but any four of us can act as a committee. Um, and, and so it might be interesting in that discussion to hear, to Ms. Borowski's point, I like that idea, pick two, right? And if everybody on this committee pick two, if you have four people that pick two, that's the committee acting, right, in terms of giving guidance. And if you don't, then, then that tells us something, too, that there really is a diversity of views. I, at the end of the day, though, I mean, I, I, I want to be clear that I don't think it's the committee's role to tell the superintendent how to enroll students in kindergarten. Um, but it, it is the committee's role to be responsive to the concerns of the public, to set policy, and I think priorities is part of policy. 
Um, I think that how things are communicated and rolled out to the public, that's part of what we evaluate um, the superintendent's goals on, right? So communication is one of the points. And of course, in budget, we decide if there's going to be a subsidy or a change in the tuition, it comes from us. So I think you need all seven of us. You need the superintendent and you need the six people on this committee to work together to give some clarity to, to future students and, and parents about how Reading is going to handle what has become, I, I think, a problem that you know, is, I think it's really difficult for parents to face a choice between a very high price tag or um, the perhaps equally, in, in some people's view, high price tag of having to not send your kid to your neighborhood school. I don't think that's a good choice for anyone to have to make, but I, I think this issue deserves thoughtful deliberation from all seven of us in, in, a, in a way that starts with this question of integrated or not integrated and moves out from there to priorities. So. That's or where ten I see this of going. us, perhaps, the whole well, leadership team. More, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. there's six people right. with a vote here and one yeah. superintendent. We will so. Have a so we're going to. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions? Does with a yes. I actually had a question about. Can you come up so it goes on TV? Question about one of the last slides. Sorry, my name's Kelly Roden. From one of the last slides about the um, budget, I think you talked about. And if we were to have limitations on kindergarten, I was just under the impression that any money that is brought in via full day kindergarten tuition should be used for full day kindergarten tuition. The costs associated with running the full day right. program. So if we did have less full day students, we would have less money needed for it. You can't have less of one principal. That's not the dollars. Yeah, it, so I, I don't know if you want to answer that. It's slightly more complicated because if you have right. one less or five less full day, you're not necessarily going to be able to remove an entire teacher if they're spread across the district. So it's not necessarily a one for one where if one student comes in, we're right. hiring a teacher. So it, it's a combination of you'd have to see how many less you, how many less teacher, how many less students you have, but then there's also the ongoing cost of the principals, the secretaries, the rest of the cost of running the program, we don't get to, sorry, Lisa Marie, I don't get to reduce Lisa Marie's time because she has only half day kindergarten in her school. I wouldn't be able to reduce the principal. So there are certain costs that wouldn't necessarily be a one for one reduction. Right, I understand the one for one reduction. I was just thinking that if you were to and I don't think this is ideal at all either, but if you did have to set limitations and you did have to set limits on how many full day kids you could have, then you could budget differently with the money you would expect because you wouldn't necessarily need more classes, I'm assuming, more teachers. Right, but you would have to cut your budget. Because we take an offset into the budget, so we take appro approximately a million dollars of the right. tuition that we receive. So if we're taking less of that into the budget if I don't have an equal reduction in expenses. So I would then need to go, in order to take less of an offset, I have to cut expenses. So I would have to say if I'm taking average, if I say I'm going to take $60,000 left, I have to tap a teacher on the shoulder and the teacher is gone. So well, it could result in higher class sizes. Well, I would just argue that that might not necessarily be true in the case that you have eight kids right now in one class, so you'd be taking and putting them in a class <coughs> could use more kids in them. Those are half-day students. Right. You can't, you can't, I, um, I can't take an offset for those half-day students. But I'm saying that would be if there was limitations students. to the amount of kids you brought into full day. You were talking about right, the lottery Right, we would still have to make a reduction to our budget, which would not necessarily just be a cut to teachers and paraeducators because of the way the tuition is broken down. Mm -hmm. I get that. Um, I had one comment, I guess, as well that's not about this, but about the, the um, percentile of disadvantaged students um, economically, taking advantage economically of, right, of the yep. full day. Mm -hmm. um, from my experience just last year with a kindergarten I have this year and a kindergarten coming in next year, there I don't think was anywhere that you could look up or nothing was communicated to me or my family or anyone that I know about, about there even being an option of having reduced or free uh, full day kindergarten. So if you don't even know it's there and you go to sign your kid up for a kindergarten, you see the price tag and you can't afford it, then you don't choose it. But if you know that there's the potential of an option, if that is communicated, 
then perhaps you'd have more people taking That's advantage good to know. of it. Thank that, you. that should probably go in the letter that goes out to the potential kindergarten parents. Yes, the, the, the tricky part is they may not be identified yet as economically disadvantaged. Well, so that's what I think the... Do. Well, I yeah. think you could put it out as a whole to everybody. Yes, right. nope, it's an excellent point. That's all I can think of right now. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Dr. Dar. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. So um, we're going to do our liaison uh, update and appointments. So actually, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read down what our um, we may have a slight change from what I handed out a little earlier. But um, so I'm going to make a motion that um, these are the proposed um, updates and changes to our school committee liaison responsibilities. So for the audit committee, um, replacing Jean uh, Borowski would be um, Nick Bovin. Uh, I, my term, I'm still on the audit committee, Elaine Webb. Finance committee liaison, um, uh, let me just make sure, oh wait, hold on, I had another sheet, sorry, I got it. Finance committee liaison would be um, Sherry Vandenacker. Uh, recreation committee um, we're going to replace Ms. Borowski with Mr. Robinson um, selectman liaison we'd like to have list both uh, Mrs. Vandenacker Sherry Vandenacker and Chuck Robinson it tends to be a uh, tough one to get to um, Brennan Coalition against substance abuse uh, that new uh, liaison would be Linda Snow Doxer our celebration committee, we've had Everett Blodgett for as long as I've been on the committee, and he would like to retain that, and we do have the ability on many of these liaison roles to have committee mem um, community members be our representative, um, so we're going to do that. On the Human Relations Advisory Committee, um, I'm going to take that, Elaine Webb. Um, RCT Board of Directors, Mr. Bobbin is going to continue to keep that. The Superintendent Evaluation, that isn't really assignment, that's really the chair or the designee. Um, CPAC is going to be Mrs. Borowski, and then uh, Permanent Building Committee, Mr. Robinson will, will stick with that right now. And the, there's a new committee that Mrs. Borowski um, may have, I think, mentioned in her report, the 375 Celebration Committee, and Mrs. Borowski will take that role. So that's the motion of the updates and changes. So I'm going to second that. Is there any discussion about it? Just a little. Um, I just wanted to say that I really appreciated my time on the CPAC. I learned so much, um, and so I am thrilled that Mrs. Borowski is taking it over. I know the CPAC wanted a change. The more people that could experience the discussions and the mix of people, the better. I still plan to attend sometimes. Um, so I thank you for taking over. I thank the CPAC for always welcoming me and all I've learned from all of you. And watching you get up, up to speed, Alicia, Ms. Williams was just really incredible. So um, any other discussion? Just ready for the vote, all those in favor? Thank you. Is there any uh, items that committee members would like on future agendas? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking. I think uh, my colleague. Just a Okay. Okay. Um, motion to protect the bargaining position of the board. We move to enter into executive session to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining, non-represented personnel and the approval of minutes not to return to open session. Second. Second. Is a roll call vote? Yes. 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 Thank you, everyone.